Welcome to Haunted Love, a werewolf shifter romance. You're watching part five of the audiobook. If you'd like to start at the beginning, click on the info card on your screen. If you want to watch straight away, you'll find a summary of the previous episodes in the description below. We hope you enjoy. Chapter 16 Chloe's Point of View Laughter erupts behind my bedroom window as the young ones engage in a game of tag. It's a beautiful day outside, warm sunlight filtering through the curtains. A year ago, my lover Nate and I would have been with them right now, doing the chasing. He'd grow bored of running after the kids and would start chasing me instead, grabbing me in his arms, telling me he loves me. How could things go so wrong? I look at my unmade bed, debating whether or not to go back under the covers. I'd promise myself to be strong today, but now that I'm up, I don't think I'll manage it. I broke my soulmate bond, rejecting the person I was destined to love forever. How could I expect to be okay after that? A part of me knows it was the right thing to do. I could barely recognize the man I'd fallen in love with. The person I thought he was would never harm my best friend like Nate had done with Emma. When I close my eyes, all I can see are images of him wrapping his hands around her neck and choking her. But then, I remember how he used to be, the way he used to say my name, like it was something to be revered. Everything hurts, body and soul, and I can't imagine it will ever stop. My phone beeps with yet another message from Nate. I promised myself not to read them, but he's relentless, and it's becoming difficult to resist. I think I would have given up by now if Vivian hadn't knocked on my door. How are you doing? She asks me with an assessing gaze. Vivian isn't the warmest person in the world. She's very private and controlling and doesn't tend to show a lot of emotions. But I've grown to understand that it doesn't mean she's uncaring. Harry wishes to see you. She tells me in a tone that implies this isn't a request. I frown. Harry knows I'm not doing very well, so if he's asking for me, it has to be important. Did something happen to Emma? I immediately get up from my chair. All right, I reply, exiting my bedroom with a nod. I find Harry in his office, shuffling through papers distractedly. He doesn't seem to realize I've arrived, so I knock on his door politely, making him raise his eyes towards me. Chloe. He gives me a tight yet genuine smile. How are you feeling? I walk over to him, with the strange impression that something is wrong, although I can't put my finger on what. Vivian said you wanted to see me? Harry nods. Emma's awake. He tells me, with a neutral expression. I'd like you to go visit her at the hospital. Emma's awake? It sounds almost too good to be true, like a huge weight has suddenly lifted off my shoulders. But I don't understand. Why Harry sounds so grim. I decide to think about that later. Right now, all I want is to check on my best friend. Of course, I reply, clasping my hands together. Shall we go now? Harry looks startled for a second, but quickly schools his features. Vivian can drive if you don't feel up to it. I blink in confusion. Why would Vivian drive me instead of him? And is he avoiding my eyes? Can't we go together? I ask. Surely Harry would want to see Emma, too. I've seen how scared he was for her when she'd been in danger of disappearing after protecting me from Nate. Harry? I insist, because it looks like he's forgotten my presence for a second. You're coming with me, right? There's a brief flicker of pain on his face before he squares his shoulder and replies, in a stern voice, I don't think I can make the time right now, Chloe. What? He can't make the time. How could he not make the time for Emma? She must be scared and lonely. I know Harry's very busy, but to the point where he can't take an hour to visit her, it doesn't sound like him. Harry, it doesn't matter what stupid fight you and Emma have gotten into, okay? She's going through a tough time right now, and I know you care, so... Harry flinches, making me lose my trail of thoughts. I realize what's been feeling so wrong since I walked into his office. It's him, that's what. His face looks pale and clammy like he's running a fever, 
His eyes are dull and there's a faint tremor in his hands. What's wrong? I ask him, annoyance giving way to concern. Are you ill? It feels ridiculous to ask. We werewolves simply do not get ill. Ever. Health is one of the biggest perks of our condition, one that extends to near-immediate recovery from any injury. The only thing that makes us sick is, Oh my God! I exclaim, as I realize what's happening. I recognize Harry's symptoms. They're ones of bond withdrawal, similar to what I've been experiencing myself ever since breaking my bond with Nate. You and Emma are mates? I ask Harry, despite already knowing the answer. He sighs. Well, not anymore. He replies, looking away. I rejected our bond. I'm stunned, speechless for a moment. How could he be so stupid? Why would you- It was preventing her from waking up. Harry snaps, before letting his shoulders sag. And besides, it's for the best. She's a human. It wouldn't have worked. You can't know that. She makes you happy, Harry, I can tell. And I'm supposed to risk her life because she makes me happy? Harry gives me a furious glare I'm not used to being on the receiving end of. I consider his words. Bonds between wolves are indeed very intense, to the point of straining at times. When Nate and I first got together, he locked me up in his room and made love to me for days on end, a rhythm I kept up with because I'm not human. I guess this would be more difficult for Emma. I mean, I'm sure you could practice some restraint, I tell him, avoiding his gaze because this is a very awkward topic to discuss with someone who's essentially like an older brother to me. Chloe, I'm talking about the fact that living amongst us would almost guarantee her getting bitten at some point or another. Harry scoffs, giving me a stern gaze. Oh, oh, that makes sense. A bite is nearly always fatal to humans. You think she'd get killed? I sum up, feeling my chest become tight with sorrow. This is a fairly good point. It would be very risky for Emma to be bonded to Harry. But what about you? I insist. Breaking a bond is painful, Harry. I should know. I'm fine. Harry assures me, with a confident smile that loses its effect because of how exhausted he looks. You're really not. Well, if anybody asks, you'll say I'm doing just fine. Harry commands, in a tone that leaves no room for discussion. You mean if Emma asks. I sum up with a frown, because I know I'm going to have to do as he says. This isn't a friend asking me for a favor. This is my alpha giving me an explicit order. I may not like it, but I can't tell him no. Harry shows me the door in a clear sign of dismissal. Go see her, he says, though not unkindly. It would do you both good to have a friend right now? I leave to get my things and drive to the hospital shortly after that. Chapter 17 Emma's doctors won't let me see her before three days later. I've been waiting impatiently for this visit, but now that I'm standing by her door, in a brightly lit hospital hall, I'm too nervous to knock. I haven't seen her, physically, since the accident. She's probably badly hurt and I know it's going to kill me to see it. Not only that, but will she want to speak to me? It's essentially my fault she's in here, and while it was easy to forget how badly she was hurt while she was a ghost, she must have awakened to a world of pain. A cruel reminder of the accident she'd been in, an accident I'd unwillingly caused by becoming her friend. If I'd stayed away, Nate wouldn't have hurt her. But this isn't about me. This is about Emma. I have to be there for her, despite the guilt and shame I feel. I briefly knock on her door before entering her room, which is a cheerless shade of beige that seems to absorb light rather than reflect it. Add the constant hum of machinery, and this has to be one of the most depressing atmospheres to wake up to. Amidst it all is Emma, propped up in a seated position by her inclinable bed. She's hooked up to a bunch of machines, but what is most striking is how bruised and swollen her face is. Her expression is hopeful to the point of fragile, though it quickly disappears when she recognizes me. Chloe? She exclaims in surprise. Hey, I say, voice a little tight. I walk beside her, not missing how her eyes keep drifting back to the door like she's expecting someone else to come in. I'm so happy you're finally awake. How are you doing? I ask, squeezing her hand. Emma shrugs before grimacing in pain at the movement, 
Me? Oh, not too bad. She jokes, tone light. Well, apart from the food that is, truly awful stuff hospital food. I can't help but wince at the sight of her, trying to be brave despite her situation. Emma, look, I just want to say... Her eyes widen in panic and she interrupts before I can continue. You wouldn't believe what they gave me for lunch, she says. Practically a crime against humanity. Emma, take this gray slime, for example. Emma, I've been naming the dishes based on their potential threat level to human life. Emma, stop, I plead, squeezing my hand a little harder. You're doing this thing where you make bad jokes instead of discussing your feelings. She laughs a little, rolling her eyes. She's used to me seeing right through her tough girl facade. Not that Emma isn't tough, but it's not because she tends to avoid her feelings that she doesn't have any. She looks hesitant for a little moment, but then... She squares her shoulder and looks at me straight in the eyes. Where is he? She asks, in a vulnerable tone I've never heard her use. Is he okay? It's pretty obvious who she's asking after, but I'm still surprised. The thing about Emma is that she's been on her own since she was very young. Her self-preservation instincts pretty much define her entire personality. So, for her to be so obviously concerned for Harry, when I know for a fact that she would have been solely focused on her condition only a month ago, is kind of mind-blowing. I want to tell her the truth, but Harry specifically asked me not to. And it's not that I can't disobey my Alpha, but I can't do it when I trust him to know what's best. If he thinks Emma should be kept away from our world, despite how much he cares for her, then he's probably right. I don't want to see my friend get hurt, or worse, killed, any more than he does, so... Oh, he's fine. I assure her with the most confident smile I can manage. Don't worry about him. Emma gives me a considering glance, before sighing in relief. Her eyes immediately turn back towards the door, and she's suddenly looking so hopeful it makes me wince in discomfort. Of course, she expects him to visit her if he's well enough to do so. And I can't lie and say he doesn't want to. She's insecure enough to believe it and be upset over the fact. He won't be coming, though, I tell her, heart squeezing at her crestfallen expression. It's better he doesn't during the recovery. Emma's eyes instantly darken in suspicion. I thought you said he was doing fine. He is, I reply, lying through my teeth. It's just a precaution. Remember the healer who came to see me before? She suggested it. Emma's brows furrow in worry. And what about you? She asks me, genuinely concerned. How are you doing? I would like nothing more than to rely on my friend's strength to help me navigate my pain. But Emma doesn't need me to burden her with my issues, not when she's lying in a hospital bed. I'm always burdening people with my problems. I... I'm okay. I begin, immediately receiving an unconvinced glare for my efforts. For real, Chloe, talk to me. Emma insists, making me smile. She might not be the most approachable person, but once you've earned her trust, Emma's easily one of the most loyal friends I know. It's been... difficult, I confess, though instantly feeling embarrassed at the confession. Emma's been hurt by Nate, so how can the fact that I miss him not feel like a betrayal to a human who'll never fully understand what a soulmate bond feels like. Though she is looking like the very image of understanding right now. You can talk about him, you know. She says softly before adding jokingly, I'll keep the insults to myself, I promise. I know she means it too. But she can't even begin to understand what it's like being torn from your mate. I feel incomplete, numb one moment, and torn with anxiety the next like I've lost a limb whose absence haunts me every waking moment to the point of pain at times. But mostly, there's an all-encompassing sadness that can easily feel like dread, like the absolute certainty that I won't make it without Nate. She wouldn't understand. And what's more, she'd worry about Harry, and with good reason. It's been difficult, but I'll be fine, I tell her. Except, I don't know if that's true. Chapter 18 In the following weeks, I kept visiting Emma at the hospital almost every day. Despite her recovery being slow, frustrating her to no end, she is making good progress, 
and the doctors expect her to be able to go home in about another month. It helps me being around her, giving me the motivation I need to keep away from Nate. I still miss him to the point of physical pain. But I'm feeling braver and more assured with my decision than ever. I can't go back to him after what he's done. He's changed and I have to accept that. If only it didn't feel like it was all my fault. Like the bond wasn't what had corrupted him. Emma keeps assuring me it isn't. But I have trouble believing it. If anything, it only revealed who he always was. She tells me, seemingly convinced. I don't know if that makes me feel better or worse. Was I a fool, forever loving him so deeply? At home, things have been difficult, especially for those of us in the inner circle who know about Harry's bonding sickness. With him being too unwell to keep up with his usual duties, we all try to cover for him, though it's not always easy when none of us are alphas with the same effortless authority he does. But there's no other choice. Not when Harry's looking increasingly worse every day, face downright ashen now, with bluish bags under his eyes, and moments of absence where he doesn't even seem to be aware of our presence. It's getting increasingly difficult to keep this from Emma, who spends almost all our time together trying to get me to talk about Harry with more or less subtlety. I'm swimming in guilt. What am I supposed to tell her? That he barely eats and spends most of his days wincing in pain when he thinks nobody's looking. I don't understand why he's like this. Vivian tells the healer who comes to check on us. Chloe's not nearly as sick as he is. It's true. I can't say I'm doing great, but in comparison to Harry, I'm in stellar health. The heart wants what it wants, the healer replies. From what you told me, Chloe's mate was being a threat to her and her loved ones. She may love him still, but her heart was resolved when she broke their bond. She doesn't have to say any more for us to see her point. It's not the same for Harry because he doesn't want to be away from Emma. He wishes to protect her, yes, but that doesn't take away from the fact that he yearns for her presence. That's it, I declare, feeling resolved. He's going to rekindle their bond whether he wants to or not. Don't try to stop me, I add pointing towards Vivian. Chloe... No, I interject, feeling fed up. He thinks he knows better than everyone else, but he's being downright... Chloe? Vivian cuts off. I agree. Go. You're like a sister to him, and you're Emma's friend. He'll listen to you. I'm stunned, speechless for a second. I was expecting her to protest and take Harry's side. But I'm quick to recover and head to Harry's room before she can change her mind. He's slumped on a couch when I arrive, eyes half-closed. Harry, you can't keep doing this to yourself. I call out, kneeling beside him. It's killing you. He slowly turns to me and gives me a dazed look, which makes me wonder if he understands me at all. We're going to visit Emma and you're going to accept her as your mate, and then you're going to get better, okay? I tell him, squeezing his arm to get his attention. He slurs out something incoherent and closes his eyes with a tired sigh, head rolling to the side. I'm absolutely terrified. I try to shake him awake several times, but to no avail. Please wake up, Harry, I plead. I check his pulse on instinct, but thankfully, he's still breathing. There's just one thing left for me to do. I'm getting Emma, I tell Vivian as we cross paths while I'm rushing downstairs. Her eyes widen and she nods, watching me rush to my car. I unlock it, and I'm about to climb inside when a familiar voice makes me freeze in my tracks. Hey, baby. This is the voice that's been haunting my dreams ever since I've broken my soulmate bond. A voice which used to make me feel all kinds of joy whenever it would whisper sweet words into my ear, and then all kinds of hurt when that same warmth dissolved into cold anger. Nate, I turn, hard in my throat, seeing him again, right beside me, after desperately missing him for so long is like a punch to the gut. I'm breathless mind blank, my entire body screaming at me to go to him. He gives me a dashing smile, the kind that makes me go weak, his hazel eyes warm with love. Come here, he says, opening his arms. I don't know what happens, but the next thing I know, I'm sagged against him, breathing him in like it's the only thing keeping me upright. Maybe it is. I feel him scent mark me with vigor, 
running his wrist all over me, paying special attention to my neck to reclaim me as his. I should be annoyed, but all I feel is joy. Though, in the back of my mind, the image of Harry's pale skin is still present, and soon enough, I'm pushing Nate away, to get into my car. I... I have to go. I can't do this now, I tell him. I'm expecting anger, but instead, his eyes go soft and full of concern. What's wrong, baby? Tell me and I'll help you. I grab his hand, pulling him. There's no time. We'll talk on the way. Come on. Nate follows after me, confusion written all over his handsome face. Harry is sick, I explain, opening the door to my car. We have to go get Emma. Nate stops dead in his tracks. Sick? He tells me, expression going oddly blank. Yes, I insist, pulling on his hand. Emma's his mate and they've been apart for too long. Nate's frown turns into a slow, spreading smile, and his eyes begin to sparkle in worrying interest. Well, seems like the tables have turned. He smirks, pulling me against him. I try to break free of his hold, confused. Can he see how urgent this is? Nate, we need to go now. If we don't get Emma, Harry could die. I press, trying to make him understand. Oh, we wouldn't want that. He replies, making me breathe in relief. But then, Nate snorts and adds, Not when I could kill him myself. What did he just say? I frantically search his expression, but Nate looks determined and as serious as ever. I choke on my next breath, shock making my entire body tremble in horror. He means it, I realize. He really means it. But how, how can he... I feel faint. Don't look at me like that, baby. I know you care about him, but you'll realize this is for the best. He's been keeping us apart, see? Banishing me from our pack. From you. He's had it coming. He should have known what it would do to me. He tenderly caresses my cheek, on which tears have begun to fall. You can't, I protest in a weak voice I'm ashamed to hear. The others won't let you. But I've been conditioned to quiver at every one of Nate's frowns, fearing the familiar impatience beginning to taint his loving expression. They will if I officially challenge him as Alpha. Nate interrupts himself when he notices my crumbling expression. You only have yourself to blame, baby. You let him convince you to break our bond despite knowing what it would do to me. Can't you see it's killing me, being apart from you? You can't blame me for wanting to live, do you? I stare at him, his crazed eyes determined and think back on Harry's ashen expression as he passed out in front of me. Suddenly, hot, righteous anger replaces my anguish. What I see is that while Harry can barely stay awake, you're strong enough to be making cruel plans. I spit, pulling away from him. This only makes Nate laugh in excitement. Oh, now this I have to see. He says, grabbing me again and pulling me after him. Our almighty Alpha reduced to a useless lump all because of some dumb human bitch. I won't let you hurt him. I protest, pulling on his hold to keep him in my place, though without success. Nate twists my arm, making me gasp in pain, and pulls me towards him. You will, though, he tells me. Want to know why? Because if you do, I'll spare his precious little pet. How's that? I gape at him, astonished at the horror spilling out of his mouth, a mouth which used to kiss me so tenderly. Get it? Stand by me and Emma lives. He pulls on my hair. Go against me and I'll kill her and make Harry watch. And then I'll kill him too. Nate whispers before pulling me into an angry kiss that makes me sick to my stomach. My eyes remain wide open in horror as I let him do what he wants to me in the hope that it will appease him somehow. I have to do something. My gaze fall onto the tree line of the woods. And there, behind a trunk, is a small brunette, gaping at me in horror. Max! She must have heard the whole thing. I've never been so ashamed in my entire life. There's nothing like a child's innocent gaze growing scared to make you realize how dire a situation is. But then, Max's expression grows cold and determined. She gives me a little nod, 
before dropping to the ground and transforming into her wolf form. I can only watch as she disappears into the woods. Thank you for watching. To get to the next part, please click the thumbnail on your screen. And please consider giving this video a like and subscribe if you enjoyed it.